Dad, can you turn your mic off? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, good morning. You guys go ahead and stand. We love hearing Dad, but we don't love hearing him sing in our ears. We love hearing him sing, just not in our ears when we're singing. Um, before we get started, I want to um, tell everyone thank you for just your enormous love. And um, Dad had shared last Sunday that it's so different being on the other side of loss. And you just so appreciate everybody who just is there and... Um, you just feel the love and you feel um, the fact that Eagles Way Church is a family. We are a family. You're my family. And I love being in this family with you guys. Um, Psalm says that send out your light and your truth and let them guide me. Let them lead me to your holy mountain, to the place where you live. It says, there I will go to the altar of God. And at the altar, at the table right here, is the source of all my joy. So this morning, we welcome you to the table. We welcome you to the altar. And I pray that this becomes the source of all your joy. Let's worship. We don't have a drummer yet, so oh. we're just gonna... let's worship in a minute. <laughs> oh, there he is. Yeah. Everybody give him a hand. Greg's not slack. Greg works with our youth and he comes here and does this. He's the hardest working musician. Precious blood 
cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasures you found. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. You are good, good. Lord, you have examined my heart and you know everything about me. You know when I sit down or when I stand up. 
You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel, when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it. Lord, you go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing over my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you're there. And if I go down to the grave, you're there. If I ride on the wings of morning, or if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there, your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. As I meditated on these lyrics all week long, that verse, you can't help but this verse to become so alive to you. That of all the things that he created and the people he created and the massive beauty that he knows every thought you have, he knows every tear that falls down your cheek, he knows every hurt, he knows every joy, he knows everything and he's there. There's never a time where his presence is not with you. Even at sometimes when it feels like you're far away, you may be far away here, but you're not far away from his presence. He's always there. And so as I sing this next song, let the lyrics just become the meditation of your heart and let thanksgiving pour out for the reality of the truth that these words convey.
There's no place I can go, your love won't find me. No place I can hide that you don't see. No place I could fall, your love couldn't catch me. You see it all, you see it all through eyes of love. Sing it with me. There's no place I can go, your love won't find me. No place I can hide that you can't see. No place I could fall, your love won't catch me. You see it all, you see it Thank you, God, for your presence. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, that you're always near, before us, within us. And we are thankful, God, for who you are, for all you've done, for what you're doing, for what you're going to do, Lord.
you God we say you are good we thank you for your goodness and we just praise you today and we give you so much thanks God and everyone says amen I mean how many agree he is good you're here this morning so he's good you breathing Daddy always used to say, but rather be here than in jail. How I many rather be here than in jail? Better be here in the hospital. Yep. Rather be here than a lot of places. If you are, thank you for over the years filling out these cards. It helps us keep up with you. And uh, on the back, there's always a place for prayer requests. And if you're a guest, we'd appreciate you filling out the card. 
And at the end of the service, when the buckets are passed, if you just drop it in there, we promise we won't come beating on your door. I got one, thank you. We won't come beating on your door. We may get a sweet email from us, but how many like sweet emails? I get emails every now and then. I ain't real sweet. But uh, it's good to get sweet emails. So, been a different week, but uh, a, a good week, been a progressive week. I know Dusty's thanked you, but thank you from my heart for everything you did over the past several weeks. It's been a long six weeks, but um, it's certainly different, but in a good way. And we're at peace. We have had a good week. I may share a little bit about that with you later on, but let's pray. Father, thank you for the banquet that we've come to today. Thank you for the table that you've set before us. Help us, Lord, to serve it well. Help us to be receptive to it. Help us, Lord, not only to hear it, but, Lord, to do it. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. If you are, haven't been with us over the last several weeks of this year, yearly we normally have a theme, or last year we had a paradigm shift. We talked about not just doing, but coming from our being. In Him we live and move and have our being. And our doing is much more effective when we're being who we ought to be. And this year, a parable just blew up in us. And it's the parable that Jesus talked about a banquet. Now, a banquet and a feast are basically the same thing. And aren't you glad that Christianity is a joyous occasion of life? It's a joyous journey. I remember as a little boy, I, I, as I got to be a teenager, I kind of put the Lord on a shelf and uh, basically told him I'll be back when I get older and, uh, because I want to have fun. And so I put Jesus on a shelf and said, I'll see you when I'm about 60-something years old and I have all this fun in my life. I'm so glad I took him off the shelf. And for the last 40-something years, it's been a joyous occasion. I'm glad it is a banquet, it is a feast. And the Masiatic banquet was something that the Jews talked about all the time. And they said that the banquet was going to be when God would break into history and when the golden days of a new age would begin. Some people are afraid of that word new age. Let me tell you something about new age. New age started when Christ died on the cross. We, were, we went, came into a new age. And it's a good new age. It's a new age of the kingdom. It's a new age of grace. It's a new age of love. It's a new age of mercy. It's a new age of understanding. They didn't have this understanding before Christ came. We didn't have this liberty before Christ came. And a lot of people think that this golden age is going to happen when the rapture of the church takes place. Or that, well, when the millennium, millennium reign of Christ takes place. Or some be, even believe that the Sermon on the Mount cannot be lived out until the millennial reign and Christ is actually here on the earth to help us to do that. Aren't you glad that we can live this glorious, wonderful life now? Here's Jesus' perspective of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is a banquet. It's the most joyous experience of life. Locke, the great philosopher, defined laughter as the great sudden glory. You, glad for, you ever had just an outburst of a laughter? Then it feel good. How many would rather laugh than cry? Unless it's a joyous cry. I saw my mother have a joyous cry last week when she saw my daddy and her transition of one foot here and one foot there. And when she saw him, she had these tears, but tears of joy and that the reuniting with the one, her love of her life. And so God wants us to be joyful. Now, a feast, listen to this, this is good, is laying hold of the divine potentialities. It's a receptive state of mind toward all spiritual Good. It's a receptive state of mind to all spiritual good. And the table is for continual growth in life. There's a natural table that is a continuous growth or sustainer in life. We ate when we were young to grow. 
and we ate when we got older to sustain. Of course, some of us still keep growing. <laughs> but the table was the place at our house. It's not so much now, but the table, when I came up, every evening at the dinner table or the supper table, if you're from the South, we sat down as a family and ate. Now, I know for some of you that's strange, that you actually sit at a table and you actually have the whole family there and there's no iPhones and there's no iPads and everybody looks at each other eyeball to eyeball and we actually talk instead of text. And so at this table was when we just, Daddy would take that opportunity to do one of two things. It was a time for him to go, Buren, proud of you today. Buren, you did a good job at this or that or another. But every now and then, and more then than every, that he would have that opportunity to say, how was school? Did you get your homework? What's this note about? And there's those times I'd go, you know, you really are making this meal hard to digest. And so what I want to say to you as daddy this morning is that the table is not only a place to come and grow from, but it's a place to come and sustain your spiritual growth, to continue to input into your spiritual growth so that every now and then at the table when you're taking the bread of strength or you're drinking the wine of joy, you eat the meat of doing his will. And sometimes you hear something at the table that goes, that's not the will of God, and we need to change our ways and do the will of God. Okay, everybody like, like that one. It's time to go, you know, this is the will of God. Jesus said, my meat that I give you is the meat of the will of God. It's when you want to do what he wants you to do. Now, I'm going to read this parable that Matthew said. Matthew wrote, this was between 80 and 90 A.D. And it's important you know that because when I read this parable, it gets a, it's the same parable that Luke talked about, but it's a little more mm, scary. Jesus told the other parables, he said, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a king who prepared a great wedding feast for his son. And when the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to notify those who were invited, but they all refused to come. So he sent out other servants to tell them the feast has been prepared. The bulls and fattened cattle have been killed. Everything is ready. Come to the banquet. But the guests he had invited ignored them and went on their way, one to his farm, another to his business. Others seized his messengers and illustrated them and killed them. The king was furious, and he sent out his army to destroy the murderers and burn his town. And he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, and the guests I invited aren't worthy of the honor. Now go out into the street corners and invite everyone you see. So the servants brought in everyone they could find, good and bad alike. Aren't you glad of that? And the banquet hall was filled with guests. Now I want to stop right there. Jesus is saying the reason this was written in 80 AD, the destruction of Jerusalem happened in 70 AD. And so really it's a prophetic word that Jesus is saying, because you're rejecting me, because you're rejecting this banquet, then there's going to come a time of destruction in your life. And it doesn't have to be mass destruction like this, but what we all have to understand, if we don't partake of the banquet, it can result in some destructive things in our life. We can, we're going to eat something. We're going to partake of something. And so it's either things that's going to nurture us and help us or things that could hurt us. And so that's, it's really two parables in the one. But what I really want to focus on is this last part. But when the king came in to meet the guests, he noticed a man wasn't wearing the proper clothes for a wedding. Friend, he asked, how is it? that you are without the wedding clothes, but the man had no reply. And there's a reason he didn't have a reply. Then the king said to his 
to them, throw him into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is not an outer darkness of weeping and gnashing of teeth that is an eternal state of hell, but it is a weeping and a gnashing of teeth that he fell to benefit from the table. You see, back then, everybody was given a wedding garment. If you were invited, you were given a wedding garment. You were given the garment months and months before the feast. And so you were to keep that wedding garment. You were to keep it clean. And so when the time for, the, for it to start, you had your garment and you had it on. And you came to the feast prepared. Aren't you glad that he provides the garment? All I have to do is to put it on. I want to, some, the refusal to, by some to the invitation was not bad in themselves. They were, just do, they, were just take, they were just doing what they wanted to do. They weren't out carousing somewhere. They weren't out committing great sins. They just didn't want to go to the banquet and decide to do something else. They let, listen, they let the temporal things distract them from eternal things. The tragedy of life is to let second best shut out the best. Things which are good shut out things that are supreme. Because they're good in themselves, but there's something that's better than good. There's a best that we may think, but there's a best that's better than that best. And so, what Jesus is wanting us to do, he wants us to not miss out. You know, my, I've said this so many times, I feel like over the years, my greatest regret in life is not going to be what I did. It's going to be what I didn't do. My greatest regrets in life is going to be the fun and the excitement and the joy I could have experienced and I didn't. Those are the greatest regrets. Amen? You ever, you ever missed a party and everybody tell you how great a party it was? I, I missed it. I could have been there. Oh, man, this was the greatest church service we've ever been to. Oh, man, I missed it. I missed it. Man, you should have been there. You couldn't believe the game. It was unbelievable. I missed it. I missed it. And then he says this appeal is given to everybody. Everybody's invited. Good, bad, and ugly. How am I going to grow? How am I going to benefit from this table? How many would like to know how to do this in a real simple way? Okay. All right. One of you do? All right. I'm going to tell you two things you got to be, okay? Two things. If you don't get anything else, get this. Two things you got to be in life. Flexible and receptive. Billy used to tell me all the time years ago, if he said to me this one time, he said to me this a hundred times. Buren, blessed are the flexible, they shall not be broken. Blessed are the flexible, they shall not be broken. The wine skin was flexible, and so when the new wine went in and started fermenting, it could expand. It could take it. I got to be receptive. Receptive of new things. New things are good things. Nothing wrong with that. But there's this New Testament that came in the being. Let me just read a couple of, in 2 Corinthians 3, 1 through 2. And we, are we beginning to praise ourselves again? Are we like others? We need to bring you others of condemnation who ask you to write such letters on their behalf. Surely not. This is not the scripture I wanted. I wanted 1 Corinthians 3. That was my bad. I gave you the wrong scripture. 1 Corinthians 3. I knew when I started reading that, ah, man, I don't even know what I'm preaching. 1 Corinthians 3 says, I didn't give you strong meat. I had to give you milk because you can't digest the milk because you haven't grown. You haven't matured. You haven't come to the place. Let's just jump over the Hebrews. I know I got that scripture right. And in Hebrews, I hope I did. Hebrews says, 
something. Oh, that's the scripture. I just read it. I just quoted most of it. You got it. Let's go on to Hebrews. There is much more we'd like to say about this, but it's difficult to explain, especially since you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. You've been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's Word. You're like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. I don't want that to be said about me 10 years from now, 5 years from now. I don't, I, the, the thing about Christians over the long haul find themselves still drinking the milk of the word and not going on to the meat of the word going on with God growing in him and so I want to take you on a process and this process is so simple but it's so profound in 2nd Peter chapter 3 verses 1 through 3 or 3 through something by his say by his divine power God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. In a nutshell, he says, I've given you everything you need. The table is set. The food is there. The wine is there. Everything you need, the bread is there. I have given you my power. I've given you my promises. I've given you my provisions. I've given you everything you need. You have no excuse for not exhibiting an excellent life in this world. No excuse. And that's why he said to the man, where's your wedding garment? I gave it to you. I provided it for you. All you had to do was put it on. And because of that, you're going to experience some bad, you're going you're gonna to experience gnashing of teeth. Have you ever experienced gnashing of teeth? You have. <laughs> Because you've done this. Anybody ever did that? Did that because you did something stupid? Or you did something because somebody else did something stupid? Or you did, you, it's gnashing of teeth. Why? Because we do stupid things. Yeah. We do stupid things. I know people tell me, don't say stupid. Stupid things. We do stupid things. And Jet, like, he goes, what the heck? What the heck? And, and that's the one that was just getting on to him. And I, I'm sorry, I know. I, I, anyway, I said, let the boy say heck. We're taking all words from Christians. They can't say anything to try to describe their emotion. And what he's, what he's trying to do is, why did I do that? Or, or what, is the, what the heck? What are you doing? And he's saying it. And I'm, don't take all the words. And I happen to look up the word heck. It's in the dictionary. And it's an okay word. It's not profanity. It's an okay word to say now. Because it's better than saying the other. Because most of the time, I know what y'all say. Yeah, you know what you say. I said it myself every now and then. <laughs> so I need to take Jet's word. Better word. <laughs> How am I going to do this? He gives us the formula. And he says in 2 Peter, beginning at verse, In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous proportion of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with patient endurance and patient endurance with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love for everyone. Now just hold that scripture up there because I want to show you what he's saying. First of all, he says, by faith, how many know you got to have faith? He begins with faith to do this. 
Faith is important because the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. He that cometh to God must believe that he is God and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith is important because the Bible says by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Faith is important because the Bible says I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but the Christ says I live by the faith of of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. Faith is substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. By it, the Bible says, the uh, elders in the Old Testament received a good reputation by their faith. Yet, here's how it starts. Let your faith be the conductor of of your life come from the posture of I am this now and if I do this my faith is going to produce moral excellence and moral excellence is going to produce knowledge the faith flows out of faith flows everything see it as it is already done Years ago, there was an evangelist named Oral Roberts. Oral Roberts was surrounded with a lot of con con controversy, for sure. But Oral Roberts had the tenacity to go on television every week with a healing line of people in wheelchairs and crutches and blind and on national television Pray for them to be healed. <laughs> you can say what you want about Oral Roberts. That was great tenacity. Going to pray for people to be healed with a national audience and receive the crit criticism and all that may come with that. I personally liked Oral Roberts. I liked I met him. He prayed for me. And I loved his prayer for me. He laid his hands on me and he said these words. He didn't say, God anoint him I thought about that this week he said God let him walk in the anointing <laughs> that's a difference we're all anointed but we all don't walk in it so he said let him walk in your anointing but there's a healing line one day and there was a little boy in true story he's in a wheelchair and in the wheelchair, he's crippled. Both his feet are crippled. They're turned in like this. And he has a shoebox sitting in his lap in the wheelchair. And he comes up to Oral Roberts, and they turn the chair to him. Oral Roberts prays for him. They look at his feet, and they're, they're still crippled. So the little boy, they, they push him down the aisle a little bit. And the little boy reaches in the shoebox, and he takes out his shoe. And his foot's all crippled. And he takes this and he starts working it and working it. And the more he worked it, the straighter the foot got. And all of a sudden, his foot was straight. The other one was still crippled. He took the other shoe out and the turned in foot. And he put it on. And he started working it and it all straightened out. Why? Because he saw it in his mind. Before he experienced it. He didn't look at his crippled feet. After he was prayed for to be healed. And say I'm not healed. He took it. Another step. Further. And if you go back to that scripture. He says out of your faith. Out of the. Look watch. Listen, you got to hear this. Out of the place that you already are. You are seated with him in heavenly places. If I see myself as who I really am, moral excellence is going to be easy because I am moral. If I see myself in that place, then knowledge is going to come. I'm not going to say I'm stupid. I'm going to say I have, div I have the divine nature of God in me. And then if I know that, listen, you will know how competent you are to prevail in self-control and patience. How many ever ask God for patience? Anybody? What if I told you you already have it? 
What if you came out of the posture of, I already am patient? Then I don't have to ask God for Because if you have the Holy Spirit, what you do, you have the fruit of the Spirit. You are patient. You've got to stop saying, I'm not what you are. You, you're, you're living a hypocritical life. That's a hypocrite to say you're not patient when you have the Spirit of God in you. You have all of this. He says, in godliness. You know what godliness is? Godliness is divine worship. And when you are in divine worship, you'll find genuine fondness for others and which will result in your true love for all mankind. You know why? You can't worship God and love God and insult a person who's made in his image. Okay. I, um, this fell out of my old Bible. It was, I didn't tear it out. It was already falling out. Because the Bible falling apart usually belongs to someone who's not. Some, some of y'all get that later. <laughs> I'll say that again in case you didn't get it, because I like it myself. The Bible is falling apart usually belongs to someone who's not. Get it, you can come. We're going to have fun here in a minute. Um, one translation of that scripture, Keith, is... Uh, Exercise your faith. And by exercising your faith, have moral excellence. Exercise moral excellence. And by exercising moral excellence, you will have knowledge. Exercise knowledge. And by exercising knowledge, you'll have self control. And by exer- I mean, getting the word exercise, yeah. <laughs> by exercising self control, then you get. Patience. And by exercising patience, you get brotherly kindness. And by, everybody got this word in here? Exercising brotherly kindness, you get love. You know, it's at a time of year when everybody's exercising. New Year resolution. Going to exercise, going to work out. Anybody know, understand that? Hmm? Y'all know what that means? You gotta, and now let me tell you something. I know some people, they start like in January 1, and by January 2, they don't see any progress. <laughs> they go, you know, you know let, me show you, let, me show you, let me show you something. I wish I could take my coat off, but I, stand up here a minute. You know, this, is, this, this is the difference in exercise. This is the difference. <laughs> this, there's a difference. There's a spiritual difference. And, and, here, <laughs> and here's a spiritual difference. Here's a, I'm just kidding. All right. So I knew, I knew, <laughs> I knew I had this in, in one of my old Bibles. And to get to this place, I had a, two words given to me this week. That for, for some of you would go, man, I wish somebody speak that to me. Mm-mm. You don't want responsibility that goes along with it. Someone s- spoke to me and said, if you're, you're a seer, you're going to see things other people don't see. And another person called me outside the church one morning, gave me condolences for my mother, but they said, Buren, you're going to, uh, your latter day is going to be greater than your former days. And you're going to hear God like you hear people. Now, that may sound wonderful, but you know what that means? Great responsibility to see and great responsibility to listen and hear. And so my first uh, hearing this week after that word was Thursday morning. And I just get up, I get dressed, I do everything I do every day. And all of a sudden, my whole being inside was changing. I felt things connecting. It was like, tick, 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 tick. and I never felt so together. And I listened to this inner voice inside me, and it said, I am recalibrating you today. And now, how I know. <laughs> That was God, is because the last time I heard the word calibrate was from E.D. Goss years ago. 
And Daddy, I'd hear him say about a car sometimes, it needs recalibrating. In other words, to hit on all cylinders, it's got to be recalibrated. And I had to hear and listen inside of me up to the click. Had to exercise listening a little deeper than I've been listening. And all of a sudden, I saw this. And at the top of 2 Peter in this old Bible I had, if you want to get to this place of the banquet and benefit from the banquet, it's going to take some effort. It's going to take effort. I'll get out of this light one. Said, he says, well, I want you to get, Billy, to love, but you can't get to love without faith can't get to love without self-control and patience. You can't get to this agape love unless these other virtues are there. It means the outstretching and consistency. It describes a horse at full gallop, the taunt muscle of strenuous and sustained effort. Our love must be energetic. It demands everything a man has of mental and spiritual energy. It means loving the unlovable, loving in spite of injury, loving when it's not returned. It is a love that never fails into which every atom of man's strength is directed. Wow. Just happen. You don't get certain bodies. It just happens. You don't get... A guy came to me years ago and said, would you just lay hands on me and impart to me everything that you have? And I looked and I said, are you kidding? You can't do that. If I, if that could happen, I'd walk around everywhere and lay hands on everybody. You can't impart. It has to be received. You have to do something. You've got to make some effort. Men, you've got to make some effort. You've got to make effort. You've got to put Action with it. It's the reason James came along after Paul's writing about grace, and which was a great word about grace. James comes along. James writes a book that almost seems like it contradicts grace, but he didn't. He said, you, you tell me you have faith. Show me your faith by your works. And James goes into the whole thing. Now that you've got this faith, you've got this grace, this is the life you ought to live. This is what, what you should look like. The destiny of the Word of God is not the printed page. The destiny of the Word of God is not knowledge. The destiny of the Word of God is not, I see that, I understand that, I know that. The destiny of the Word of God is not the printed page, it's you. Living epistles, living it out every single day. That it's, it takes tenacity. When I shared that years ago I found a picture of this horse and I wish I had it because it showed this horse in full gallop and when you see a horse really in full gallop you just see those muscles they're just taunting I mean he you can just see the effort coming out of him just with everything every fiber of his being that's what God wants out of us well what's the benefit of it Joy, peace, love, long-suffering, happiness. That's the result of it. I want that. Don't you want that? I I want that in my life. I want you to stand with me for a moment. And um, I'm going to say it one more time so that we get this. The faith he's saying to exercise is the faith in who you are by Christ you are these it's got to flow out of calling things that are not as though they were by this the elders received a good reputation by this the world was framed not by things which are seen but by things which are not seen faith is calling things that are not as though they were and the more I do that then they'll begin to manifest in my life They begin to come about. That will give us this, you know, years ago I got on this real exercise program and I I, I was looking good. I really was. I don't care what anybody says. I was looking good. And uh, Barbara would get mad at me because I'd I'd take my shirt off and 
I had a flat belly. And I, was just, I mean, I was tight. And uh, I go, look at this. And she said, quit bragging. And I, and I, I you know what? Didn't, I said, uh-uh. No, no. I ain't stop bragging. I work hard for this. I, I am not going to quit bragging about this. I worked hard for this. The Bible says bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable in all things. What bodily exercise can give you, godly exercise can far exceed the benefits of the natural benefits. They're okay, they're nice, they're fun, but there's something greater than that. Because I can have a perfect physique body on the outside and be full of dead men's bones. I may have this great physique and be just a rascal. <laughs> so, ain't that. That's good. Glad you got it. You work for it. God bless you. Hope to be there again myself one day. Don't wait on me, though. Just, but you're here. And you say, I want those attributes. I've been told I'm impatient. I've been told... I don't have any self-control. I've, been t I've told myself those things, but I, I want to stop telling myself those things and even listening to other people, and I want to benefit from it. Would you come and stand across the front today and say, I'm coming down to start this thing in the right way. I'm going to start it by faith. I am righteous. I am self-control. I am patient. Would you do that? Just come and stand. Let's, let's just watch this beginning of this journey that will supersede anything you've ever had in your life. You know, I had to, uh, had to stop years ago praying the way I was praying, especially on my way to church. On my way to church, I was asking God for the anointing. I was asking God for this, that, and another. And the Lord said, stop asking. You already got that. Release that. And so my prayer was, well, help me to release this now. Not, don't ask you for it. I already got it. You already have it. You already are righteous. You already are love. You already are patient. You already are these things. No matter what you've told yourself or what anybody else has told you, you are this. And it's just releasing what you already have. You'll never release it if you don't already have it. Got it? You can never let it come out if it's not already in there. So it's already in there. It's already in you. And will one person come stand behind each one here? And let's pray and start this journey. And uh, I was glad that God this week took the, uh, took the initiative with me and said, I'm recalibrating you today but over my lifetime I've had to do that periodically myself you're going to have to keep doing this every you're going to have to recalibrate every now and then you're going to this is going to slip away for a moment and you're going to have to reach out there and get it and bring it back in reach out there and get it and bring it back in it's don't get down on yourself when you have momentary relapses just get back up Y'all know one of my favorite scriptures, Rejoice not against me, O my enemy, when I fall, I shall rise again. I shall rise again. And you just, seven times a good man is knocked down, seven times he gets back up. That's what the scripture says. Don't mind how many times you get knocked down, how many times you get up. Paul said, I've been knocked down, but I ain't knocked out. I'm not knocked out. So, Father, today we begin this journey in a fresh and a new way, we recalibrate our life. We recalibrate, Lord, our, our understanding of how this is going to transpire in my life, how it's going to come forth from me. And I am these things, and I need to see that how you see me and then release this out of my life. And so I just begin to do that today, Lord, in a fresh and a new way. I thank you, God. I thank you. In Jesus' name. Jesus name everybody said amen amen and just walk with it bless you
You may be seated. BJ, back there on the camera, raise your hand and wave. Everybody, all the guys turn around and look at BJ. He is in need of a few more softball players. And so, uh, <laughs> everybody but Buren. No, I'm just teasing. If you are interested, go see him. He is, uh, he is in need. They're started practicing. If you have your connection cards, you can go ahead and make sure those are filled out. Our ushers are going to be receiving our morning's tithes and offerings and alms this morning. Thank you for your faithfulness. This Wednesday night is at the table. At the table is a meal that we have that is at 6 o'clock. You have got to sign up today if you want to be a part of that, if you haven't already. If you've already done it, we have about 40 or 45 that have already signed up. But if you have not yet, no, you cannot reach back in the bucket and get your card. You can just grab another card at the back and hand it to me afterwards. But uh, make sure that you get signed up. Uh, you can pay for it the night of, uh, and that is this Wednesday night. I believe that it's uh, chicken and pork tacos or make a taco salad if you want to do it that way. So it'll be great. And then we have our intentional conversations that take place. Uh, right after that on Wednesday evening. So some good things happening. Make sure that you read your bulletins. A lot of important information there. Let's stand. We're going to worship and be thankful for what God has done and is doing inside of us. Let's sing to him. Jesus is calling 
guys have a great day. We'll see you Wednesday.